up y'all and welcome to cities and urban land use part 8 in this video we're going to look at this essential question how did improvements in transport technology affect the size and structure of the American city over time and one of the key words to understand is agglomeration which is also urban nucleation or the clustering of people and businesses for mutual advantage and you can see some of the early CBDs of these cities, such as Montreal or Boston, Chicago, and St. Louis. And we're primarily going to be looking at the John Borchert model, which was developed by the University of Minnesota professor back in 1967. What he did was analyze urbanization in North America and found five distinct epochs. He analyzed urbanization in North America and categorized five distinct epochs based on the impact of a particular transport technology, which increased the rates of growth and complexity of the urban landscape over time. The first was the sail wagon epoch, which began around the start of the United States itself, around 1790 up through 1830. These cities emerged in the pre-industrial era. Now, I've been to Boston several times, and I don't remember seeing a sheep fair in the middle of the streets. The movement of people was limited and slow because of the difficulty of overland and waterway transportation. People either traveled on foot, with horses and wagons, or on sailboats. So looking at this graphic, you can see the sail wagon epic, and how the central city was quite compact because people had to have close access to the CBD. This was the starting point of what would eventually become the concentric zone model. Then there was the iron horse epic between 1830 and 1870 characterized by the impact of improved steam engine technology by James Watt. Cities expanded along with the development of steamboats and regional railroad networks. And you can even see this horse-drawn trolley in downtown Boston. Then there was the steel rail epoch between 1870 and 1920. This era was dominated by the development of long-haul railroads and a national railroad network. Many cities expanded their hinterlands dramatically in this era. And on this map especially, you can see the impact of the electric streetcar as the lines radiated outward from the central business district. You can see how the urban growth agglomerates around the rail lines, much like the appendages of a starfish. So here you can see how the city expanded along the streetcar lines. And in this graphic, you can see where the original city was and where they started to expand along the lines of the streetcars. The railroads stimulated economic growth and migration often for jobs, through the increased connectivity and accessibility expanding the CBDs. And due to the rail corridors, cities increased in size along these lines, and the range of services and employment also increased in distance from the city center. Now, of course, some cities declined that were not connected and were bypassed by the railroad network. And the form of the cities was also altered. For instance, the city's CBDs and rail corridors grew, as stated before, making for wider roads. But as you can see, the urban pattern was also altered as star patterns or the hub and spoke patterns emerged. And streetcar suburbs sprung up in the hinterlands. As you can see in this old postcard back in 1911 of Goodlawn, which was a suburb of Wheeling, Illinois. And as far as land values, the real estate around the passenger stations became more valuable and popular, especially for commercial interests. Additionally, railroads created socioeconomic divisions with some people finding themselves on the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak. So you can see that this looks more like Homer Hoyt's sector model. Then came the auto air amenity epoch. Initially, U.S. cities expanded primarily along the radial light rail lines with the expansion of the electric streetcar. Then, after World War II, the U.S. population was more able to afford automobiles through improvements in the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine as well as mass production techniques. The urban system was transformed dramatically by use of automobiles, which opened up new locations for development in between and beyond the internal rail lines. So on the map, you can see where the rail lines initially were and where actually you see a lot of the urban infill going on in between. This expanded the hinterlands even further, as well as the massive growth of suburbs. This era improved and expanded travel on the ground, sea, and air between cities greatly as well. So we can see going from the city center radiating outward through the streetcar lines, and then filling in with the use of automobiles and more integrated roads, and even the concentration of certain suburban areas as well. This certainly epitomizes the harrison ullman multiple nuclei model. This improved even more so with the establishment of highways such as the famous Route 66, also known as the Mother Road, that went from Chicago, Illinois, to the U.S. heartland, 
and ending in Santa Monica, California. Then, in 1956, with the passage of the Interstate Highway System under President Eisenhower, an organized network of roadways connected cities and people across the U.S. as never before. It also had the effect of bypassing certain towns and stops along some parts of the original routes, resulting in their decline, as seen with this abandoned gas station in New Mexico along the original Route 66 highway. This effect was also popularized in the Disney movie Cars, where Radiator Springs had fallen to the same fate. This is because the interstate highway system led to the relocation of increasingly connected economic activities to the highway interchange areas due to the reduction of travel time and shipping costs with trucks. This is what was shown in the Galactic City or Peripheral model. The highway system led to even greater suburbanization and sprawl contributing to the decline or depopulation of city centers. The hobby corridors also provided spaces where conurbations and edge cities formed, for example along I-95 from the northeast all the way down to South Florida. And of course with more urbanization also came the changes in the environment, with increased air, water, noise, and light pollution in the cities. Urban heat islands have also become an issue, where metropolitan areas retain more heat during the day due to the concrete, asphalt, and buildings in the urban landscape, unlike the suburban and rural areas. And finally, we come to the high technology epoch, which has gone from 1970 to today. Influenced by the era of jet propulsion and increasingly complex electronic, satellite, computer, and network-based technologies. So we can see, for example, Chicago back in 1875 during the steel rail epoch, and then progressing forward into the high technology epoch that we see today. Highlighted by modern buildings such as the Sears Tower that was constructed in 1973. And looking elsewhere, for example in Colorado, we can look at Denver and Colorado Springs. And this map shows relative urban density going from the red with the urban suburban areas to low density suburban areas, the exurbs, and then finally to the low density rural areas. So this shows you the growth from 1960 to 2000 and then proposed into 2040. Some geographers have proposed an extension of Borchert's model with new epics taking into account late 20th century developments and patterns of urban decline up until the 1990s when there was a resurgence of metropolitan growth. That is correct. 